One of the tenets of hypnosis is you get what you think about. And I suppose a more accurate definition would be you get what your unconscious mind spends its time thinking about. And so if you've got all of these limitations uh, that are you know, operating like you know, little uh, pieces of spyware in, in your unconscious mind, you know, um, most clients when they come, they think I'm going to put them into some kind of trance and, and help them out. Well, the truth is, I mean, is I take clients out of their trances. The I'm not good enough trance, the I can't be happy trance, the pessimistic trance, whatever it is. Because once that perception changes, they then get access to things that they could see anyways. And welcome to uh, another installment of Behind Greatness by Inspire. It's Luciano here speaking. Thank you, listener, for coming on board for yet another uh, yet another discussion. Um, I will stop short of guaranteeing, but uh, you are going to have a good time with this one as well. Uh, before we get into it, before we get into uh, our discussion with Robert, I uh, just want to remind the listener as well to subscribe. And uh, if you can, just rate us on whatever podcast uh, platform you use. We're obviously on uh, all the major ones and some of the minor ones. Um, uh, and do share. Family, friends, uh, anybody, uh, anybody you care about, just share. And the last point, uh, as uh, as most of our listeners know as well, we are a charity. If you feel inclined to donate uh, to help us uh, in our cause, uh, we're all volunteers here on the team and our guests uh, graciously give their time as well. So that includes uh, all of our guests that come on board. You can go to our website, uh, behindgreatness.org, and you can see for yourself where, uh, where, you, can, uh, where you can help. So let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, today we have Robert A. Doyle. Robert is a Toronto therapist in private practice with nearly 25 years professional experience specializing in brief therapy, ACT, A-C-T, uh, accelerated change therapy, uh, creating rapid results for countless individuals with quote unquote incurable and quote unquote chronic psychiatric conditions such as anorexia, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, anxiety, Tourette's syndrome, phobias, and addictions to adrenaline, alcohol, cocaine, smoking, gambling, marijuana, stress, sex, self-sabotage, and other debilitating life-destroying emotional conditions such as anger, self-loathing, self-doubt, all of us, all of us, I think, uh, suffer from that, self-criticism, and chronic negativity. The results... And I chuckled when I read this too, because uh, I, I've heard this, I've heard this from several people who've talked about Robert. Several clients suspect he's a wizard, while others wish they had found him decades sooner. Robert holds master level certifications in hypnosis, hypnotherapy, neuro linguistic programming (NLP), uh, timeline therapy, and is an is an uh, accredited instructor of hypnosis. Welcome to the show, Robert. Hello, Luciano. Thanks for having me. Uh, it is my extreme pleasure to have you here. Uh, and I do not want to forget, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention two other people who um, put us in touch with you. One of them directly, and that's uh, a past guest. Her name is Amy Jo Johnson. Uh, and she said uh, uh, she gave you uh, an incredible recommendation. Uh, and then, of course, uh, our mutual friend uh, Enrico Colantoni, who is uh, who's an inspire, who's an inspire advisory board member and uh, past alum, and uh, I, I'm starting to say now also our patron saint on this uh, on this podcast. He was also the first guest. Cool, Robert. <laughs> where, <is that? laughs> where do we get started? So that's the question I asked myself yesterday and this morning. Um, uh, why don't, why don't we do this? Um, I grew up as a kid here in Canada watching, uh, American TV, uh, in the eighties and nineties. And all I knew about hypnotherapy was mind control on cheesy talk shows. And I kind of know that that's not the case. Why don't you start us off at least with, uh, clearing, uh, clearing the record on that and, and, uh, and teaching us a little bit about what this means and uh, how you're practicing it. Briefly. <laughs> <laughs> Briefly. <clears throat> Thanks for the challenge. Well, 
hypnosis, I mean, the, the honest truth is uh, we know it exists. No one really knows how it works or perhaps even why it works. We just know how to make it work. There's various methods, everything from, you know, mom giving you a good scolding right through to, you know, this cheesy stuff you, you've seen on, on TV. But ultimately, it, it's, a, it's, it's the way the mind works and communicates with itself. And it's, it's a, an ultimate uh, ability to uh, work with yourself or work with someone who has your best interest at heart to help you make the changes by reaching uh, your unconscious mind. So is it mind control? Well, from one perspective, absolutely. But the question is, who's controlling the mind? Uh, the hypnotists or most hypnotists, especially stage hypnotists, want you to believe that the power is within them. You know, the old Sven Galley story, they wave their fingers and look into my eyes and I'm going to make you do things. Um, it's par partly uh, the root of the, the story of the evil eye, which came out of you know Europe, that as long as you don't look in their eye, you're OK. But the truth is, it's all words. And whether the words are coming from a, a, an external person or coming from internal self, those words make a profound impact on uh, your unconscious mind or your body mind. And uh, what a great tool that a, a person can use. So back to, is it mind control? Yes, it is. But who's controlling the mind? Is it the hypnotist or is it the person who's allowing themselves to participate in their own getting better. So from a hypnotherapy perspective, it's it the client is there because they want to get better. It's the, you know, hypnotists don't walk down the street and grab people against their will and <clears throat> put them through, th through therapy. Uh, people show up because there's changes they want to make. And so uh, usually the, the two classifications are, uh, there's uh, something going on in their life that they, they'd like to stop, you know, the usual habits, smoking, screaming, yelling, that kind of stuff. Uh, bad dreams, or it's something that uh, is motivation related. You know, they want to get to it, but for some reason they just don't get to it. And so, in it, the the whole therapy process is, is, at least from my side, is finding out what the client wants and finding a reasonable way of uh, achieving that for them as quickly as possible. So, um, uh, unlike traditional therapy, the act side of it, which is all based on action is we identify what, what the client wants, understand how that uh, change is uh, going to be integrated in, into their unconscious. In other words, it's like marriage counseling from a point of view, I guess. The, uh, we're brokering a deal between the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. Each of them may be at odds, but you know when you go to a marriage counselor, you can't have one side win because then you're still in an unhappy relationship. And these days, uh, people are so um, distracted, I guess, that they've almost lost the relationship with themselves. Mm. And and part of it has been, you know, the advent of many distractions. You know, we've got uh, all the social media things that are constantly uh, trying to get people's attention. Uh, we've got drugs, which in some cases are, are absolutely uh, useful. But um, and, until they invent a pill that teaches you to like yourself, uh, or helps you learn a skill that is contributing to some unhappiness. Um, you know, drugs are a, a band-aid, but they're not a solution. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, the training that I underwent was was looking for a way that uh, people could trust themselves more and find, in many cases, the solutions are hiding in plain sight inside themselves where, where most people won't look. So to make a Short story longer. Uh, hope that answered your question. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's. I think it's a good start because um, I've become much more interested uh, since I started to get to know you a few months back, and, and of course uh, with what Enrico and uh, paired with what Enrico and Amy Joe have uh, told me about some of your work. Uh, you know, something interesting here. We talked about the. Um, you and I have talked about the subconscious and the conscious. And in, uh, in a brief uh, synopsis on hypnosis, I read here uh, that highway trance is one of the most recognizable experiences of hypnosis. And so is love, so is anger, and the enjoyment of a good movie or great book. Absolutely. That, that, so that explains that we are connected to the state of hypnosis. Um, but what are, we, what are we really disconnected from, in your opinion? Or excuse me, no. 
how, why are we disconnected? I mean, you, you mentioned distractions, social media, and so on and so forth. Why are we really disconnected? Well, I, I think part of it is because of, of what, what people learn, either directly or, or you know, uh, by osmosis, is our modern world is, is constantly trying to take us external all the time and keep us there as long as it can. And so I think the closest relationship most people have with their unconscious life, which, you know, we owe a great deal of debt to Freud, not that I'm a Freudian, but uh, I'm more in the, the Jungian school of archetypes and, and the power of the unconscious. But <clears throat> the, the disconnect is it, most people only reconnect with themselves when they go to sleep. And, and it's mm-hmm. sort of an either or um, existence. You know, either you're, you're disconnected from your unconscious while you're awake or you're disconnected connected from your conscious mind when you're asleep. Unless, of course, you've learned a lucid dream, as you know, some of your uh, other podcasters have uh, contributed to. But it's only a fraction of the, ex- the experience a person can have of themselves. And, and, I, and I think, uh, you know, they're sort of one perspective would be cheating themselves. But, but the other perspective is, man, have they got a lot to learn about and enjoy. You know, this is where the confidence and the capability comes from is the integration of the minds uh, today. And, you know, the media would largely have you believe that um, either emotions are going to run your life or you're going to uh, turn your emotions off and, and have your consciousness run your life. I'm suggesting you use the best of each and integrate them in such a way that the emotions become an amazing uh, support mechanism and reward, uh, reward mechanism. So this is what I've found very interesting in our in our discussions the last few months. Um, for the listeners' sake, Robert and I have been talking fairly, I think, fairly frequently, um, and I've enjoyed them all. Uh, you mentioned dreams, and you mentioned integration and connection. So let's go back to dreams because we, I mean we've spoken, uh, we've discussed dreams on this podcast with uh, quite a few guests, and we're going to continue to do that. You you mentioned I'm, I'm looking down here at some of my notes um, that you, you actually dream a lot and you lucid dream a lot. <laughs> you said sometimes you need to stay up to get the rest. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but and but then you said something that was very curious to me, um, and I've just connected it to something else you've just said. Now you you told me then uh, dreams are part of our consciousness, but the question is what does it mean then to be conscious and my question to you is, I mean, that's a fabulous question, but my question back to you is, is maybe our disconnection here, most of us, uh, in the way that you've just discussed in the last few minutes, is our disconnection rooted in our inability to connect with our dream state? Wow. Um... Well, as you'll find with me, uh, one of one, one of my key key words is it depends. It depends on how you look at it. Is consciousness disconnected from dreams during day to day reality? And the answer is technically no, but experientially perhaps. And I know that sounds like I'm trying to cover all my bases, but. <laughs> Sometimes some of the great ideas that uh, come into consciousness could be considered to be a waking dream of information and content that is coming out of the unconscious. Sometimes we're aware of it, as in, oh, where'd that idea come from? And sometimes consciousness just takes credit for it, Um, which is fine because it's all you anyways. But Mm -hmm. um, are we disconnected from our dreams? Well, some people say they don't dream. I think what they're experiencing instead is they have an issue with recalling their dreams. Yes. We all dream because, you know, that's basically the language of the unconscious mind is it's processing and, and thinking for itself and, and something we can come back to if you wish on, on the unconscious or subconscious is, you know, there's a lot of uh, psychological beliefs out there that the unconscious has no ability to think has no uh, goals or agenda of its own. And of course, uh, anyone who's got uh, any kind of um, addictive compulsive behaviors uh, knows that's clearly not the case. So, you know, there's, there's depending on the school of thought through which you look at, at the various subjects, some have it more accurate, some have it less accurate, but ultimately everybody's pointing, I think, in, in generally the, the correct direction. 
that we can be more, do more, and have more. And it, it, it comes into integration as opposed to one mind dominating the other. And later on, if you want, we can also speak a little bit about from an esoteric perspective that, you know, one of the biggest secrets in, in Western psychology is that human beings actually have three minds. Let's talk, let's talk about it now. I had it in my notes. So yeah, what does okay. esoteric to you mean? And what does that mean with the third mind? Well, esoteric in its definition just means it's something that's hidden. And it's not hidden as in uh, locked away in a vault and you can't see it. It's just generally not not talked about in certain elements of science. If they don't have a viable explanation for it or it doesn't fit within their their model of uh, their their discipline, uh, they tend to just ignore stuff. So, you know, in, in uh, when it comes to, you know, mind technologies, you know, thank God it was uh, Ryan at uh, Duke University that actually wanted to explore the nature of uh telepathy sp you know that sort of stuff because there, there seem to be enough experiences in in the average person's day-to-day lives basically that uh, that there was clearly something going on and and so a a university certainly with cia funding for for you know remote viewing and other things as you know russell targ talked about and so you know it's clear from that there's you know there's two kinds of psychology they're out there or psychiatry there's the the day-to-day remedial uh, fixed problems and psychological issues and then there's the esoteric psychology which is uh, the side that embraces the additional uh, capabilities of the mind and developing techniques to enhance them. I mean, one of the largest programs that uh, of interest that the U.S. military is currently investigating is something called creating flow states. It's, it comes out of uh, research uh, that uh, uh, SEAL teams and other high-performance, high-intensity um, groups of individuals somehow seem to uh, create a particular condition amongst themselves where they all act as if they're one mind. Everybody just knows instantly what to do, where to go, how to do it. Um, as if, you know, we used to call it hive mind, but, um, but these days uh, they're, they're trying to investigate what are the circumstances and conditions that must be created, which if they can understand the conditions like a recipe, then they want to be able to teach, teach this ability. Whereas right now it's, it's, it's somewhat hit or miss because sometimes it happens and, and sometimes it doesn't, but there is a sort of a, a group mind that, that can evolve out of this. Let me interrupt you right there. Uh, yeah. Thank you for bringing that up because you had mentioned that a few months ago to me um, and I'd forgotten about a military application of what we kind of already know or feel, let's say feel, uh, yeah. to be true. Um, you, you told me, <laughs> as one of our first conversations, you said, because uh, we were talking about personal beliefs, and you said, I see it for you personally. I see it because I believe it, not I'll believe it when I see it. Mm. Uh, this, is, this is obviously... This is obviously a point of concentration, point of focus for those Navy SEALs who are training in a group in order to find themselves as one because they don't need to see anything. They already believe it and they're training themselves to tap into it. Yeah. And Okay. So Dean Radin was on the show and Dean, Dean Radin uh, is a chief scientist um, collecting evidence for uh, uh, the reality of psychic abilities. And so he was... He, he worked for a year in Russell Targ's program. And he said, basically, what you are, I think, alluding to is there's so much science, so much learning to be had, but it's being hell. I'm using my words here, right? Uh, there's a stranglehold on it for military purposes. And the general public doesn't understand that this is a science that's being studied, although we can all feel that what you've just described uh, as this Navy SEAL program, we all feel that that could be true because we've all been, we've all been in a room where we felt comfortable or uncomfortable. Well, we've also, you know, you, you've been in, in public places and, and, you know, stared at somebody and then within seconds, that person turns around and looks at you, looks at you. Yeah. Right. right. I mean, we all have these connections and it's not so much, I don't think it's so much that it's secret that people are trying to hide things from us. Mm -hmm. I think it's more like, the Western scientific method is all based upon, um, we'll call them recipes, that are reproducible and testable. 
And, and, and the problem with uh, exploring the frontiers of consciousness is the unconscious mind gets a vote, right? It's not purely a conscious mind activity. And so science is a conscious mind activity. And the two of them are, are having to learn to work together. So um, every, most people have probably had an experience of, of seeing a psychic. But if you know, if you've ever interviewed really good psychics, they'll tell you they're just like everybody else. They have great days and they have off days. Sure. The the person that is somewhat psychic, but hasn't um, hasn't the ability to to tell a client, oh, you know, today I got the flu and I, I don't really feel that good, so we're going to have to reschedule. Well, some of them might resort to unconscious or conscious performance as opposed to tapping into their psychic ability. And, and this shows up when the scientists show up because they want to impose scientific method on something that doesn't really respond to scientific method. And it's the conditions, you know, but, and so I, I think what they're looking for is finding a way where they can test it beyond subjective experience. But we haven't invented the machines yet. So, you know, Pear Institute and, and other places, thing, you know, things that Targ would have talked about. Um, uh, a lot of it was categorized in a book that was published oh, I don't know, probably about eight years ago by a lady named Lynn McTaggart. Uh, she did a great job uh, categorizing it in uh, the title of her book was uh, The Intention Experiment. And. You know, it, it covered a lot of these things that it's not that modern um, psychology or modern psychiatry is necessarily uh, blind or ignorant or resistant to it. It's just their model doesn't have any way of dealing with it. So uh, so they just don't. And and try and they try and you know, fit fit their uh, interactions within the models as they understand it. But you're right. There are all kinds of applications out there. Uh, a lot of it is is military. Um, um, and, you know, the people that are involved absolutely know it works, but they also absolutely know it doesn't work 100% of the time. And that's the the variable that, that you know, they're trying to reduce so it's, it's much more reliable. You've told me that with some of your clients, you tell them that they have a curiosity deficiency. <laughs> yeah, that's what for the mean depressed people. Uh, well, sorry, sorry, I talked over you. What, what was that comment there? I, I, I that's that's for the clients that are good at being depressed. Cool. I, like well, I look. I look at. I look at depression as just a, a, a deficiency in curiosity, and and so what I do with them is I rekindle their sense of curiosity, which gets them reconnected and. Uh, back in their own lives, uh, and then once the input starts, um, part part of the, the depression it's a loop, right? You wake up and you go, "I feel like crap." I'm going to go back to sleep. You wake up again. Oh, I feel like crap, right? You just you just keep looping on that, and and so there's not really any new information other than another day in my crappy <clears throat> crappy life and etc. So, well, the cure for it is 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 get up and do something, right? In the old days. Uh, they, they would have sent you to a work farm and you would have gone out and chopped wood and carried water and shoveled uh, the barns out and, and done a number of things. And that physical activity would have created new inputs, would have created new chemicals in the brain, would have created new opportunities. And you go to bed, you know, at the end of the day, sure, your life might still be circumstantially problematic, but you're going to feel good. You're going to feel better. You're going to feel stronger. You wake up the next day. It's not so bad. And so, you know, that's part of the, you know, the ACT therapy model is action is the cure to everything. And some of the action that some people need to have is, is be far more engaged with the curiosity that they used to have as kids. Kids are indestructible, right? They can fall downstairs and yeah. laugh and giggle. They can, they can have absolutely nothing and but a puddle of mud and come in and just have, have the time of their life. Adults have so many reasons not to have fun. And, and it's no surprise to me that, that if you live your life that way, that you have an absence, you have an absence of it. So, but I want to tie it back to one thing, yeah. which goes back to the remote viewing and all the rest of it. One of the tenets of hypnosis is you get what you think about. And I suppose a more accurate definition would be you get what your unconscious mind spends its time thinking about. And so if you've got all of these limitations uh, that are you know, 
operating like you know, little uh, pieces of spyware in, in your unconscious mind. You know, um, most clients, when they come, they think I'm going to put them into some kind of trance and, and help them out. Well, the truth is, I mean, is I take clients out of their trances. The I'm not good enough trance, the I can't be happy trance, the pessimistic trance, whatever it is. Because once that perception changes, they then get access to things that they could see anyways. And so when I started my practice, you know, what, almost 25 years ago, one of the first things I did was rather than look at it the way most people did, which is try and understand how people um, create problems and mess themselves up. I wanted to look, I started in reverse. I looked at the problems that people have and I, I sought out the individuals that got better. The people that used to be depressed, right? The people that used to be afraid, the people that used to be good at beating themselves up and no longer do it. And I wanted to know, what did you do that was different? Because, you know, there's no amount of dissecting the problem is really going to lead you to the solution. You know, so it's like trying to study dead bodies to figure out, you know, what you should, what you should do to live life. It, it, it's an interesting starting point, but practically it, it doesn't work. And so, so I, stu I studied and uh, people got better from things that supposedly you can't get better from. Um, <laughs> you, you gave, and, sorry to interrupt here, because I, I don't want to forget this. I, I, I wrote this to prompt you on it, because since we're on the subject, uh, you gave me an indication on how um, you deal with pessimistic thoughts or, or pessimists and okay. you use, their, use their strength. Do you remember what their you told me? Their strength of pessimism? Yeah, to doubt because they're doubters or yeah. they like to doubt. Yeah. To doubt I their doubt. To doubt their doubt. <laughs> right? Which then puts them in a whole new loop. And but it, but again, it, it now the conscious mind is engaged with the unconscious mind, and out of that, what are they going to learn? Well, they're going to learn they're more capable than than they believe themselves to be. So, yeah. So I mean, I, I just see people as a, you know a tremendous source of uh, wonder. I guess you know I've had some clients tell me how sorry they feel for me because I must just you know get treated like an emotional garbage dump for everybody's crap and that's not that's not the case at all i i see myself largely as a tour guide and i show people where they've hidden the best parts of themselves so you know i'm like the pirate that's got the map and x marks the spot and here's where you, you've hidden the gold in yourself which is why as you know from what you did this morning i start off every relationship with the client with um, having them do a personality test what that tells me is what do they pay attention to? Uh, ultimately, it will also show me what they don't pay attention to. And in that area of non-awareness or lack of awareness uh, is where I can slide in the hypnotic suggestions because they're not going to notice it anyways. And then I can turn the lights on for them and, and they can see where they've hidden the gold, which is usually in the corner. So uh, it's not that people are, are, are experts on their problems. Is they need to become experts on their solutions. And that's why I started in the beginning um, studying people who got better. Because according to traditional science and medicine, and especially psychiatry, and apology to all the psychiatrists out there, but you know, if you if you want to know if you've got a good psychiatrist, ask them what the treatment plan is and, and when you'll be better. Most of them will laugh or refuse to answer the question, but I have had the pleasure of meeting several really good. A psychiatrist at various hypnosis trainings, and I won't uh, mention their names because, uh, you know, as they've told me, uh, if their buddies knew they were attending these esoteric witchcraft classes, uh, they'd be blackballed in their industry. So, um, and so anyway, so I, I'm a tour guide. I get to show where people have hidden the best parts of themselves. And I, I love what I do. And I, I love the clients I work with. And, uh, you know, and, and, and anyone who knows Amy Jo uh, or Rico uh, knows exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, they're absolutely delightful people. And if only the rest of us, the world could show up and, and share that with each other, what a great place we'd have. I would agree. I absolutely agree. Uh, yeah, the potential's there. We're just not living it yet. Also agree with this. Um, let, let's talk. <laughs> let's talk a little bit about your early potential too, because I think, I think it it matters for for the listener to understand a little bit about um, your past, so that we can we can put some pieces together and why uh, this guy might be uh, speaking so eloquently uh, about esoteric matters. Um, like many 
like several other guests on this podcast recently. I don't know why. Uh, you come from London, Ontario. So yes. for non-Canadian listeners, and there are many here, uh, London is kind of geographically between Detroit and Toronto, but on the uh, Ontario side, it's Canadian. Um, yes, it's the donut shop capital of the world. Is it really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> but you did say something that sounded really funny. You said London, you you, you mentioned how you, you wanted to get out of there as you became a, a young adult. And you said London had a reputation of rolling the sidewalks up at 4 p.m. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it, 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 you know, to me, it was boring. Yes. Right. London is almost like a retirement town. Yeah. You, know, you go there and hang out with people and, and you get ready to go to bed at eight o'clock at night and uh, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and you know, my mind is uh, far more engaged and interested, I guess, in that. And it's not that um, it's competition. It's it's just, you know, if you want to talk to someone, who, who do you talk to at midnight or one or two in the morning, which is, you know, when I get some of my best ideas. Yeah, and, which is where you're your best, yeah. And, and so I went I went to York uh, in, uh, in the 70s. York uh, University in Toronto. York University in Toronto, um, just because Toronto had a 24-hour day, right? There were shops yeah. open. You want, you, want, you want to go for a drink or tea or coffee? There's a place that's always open. You know, London, good luck. You got to wait till tomorrow. So, so it was a fascinating place. And, you know, you get to meet other uh, like-minded uh, individuals. And then, you know, you get to discover in, in reality that like attracts like. And, and, you know, if your unconscious guides you in, in, in the right way and your conscious mind pays enough attention, say, okay, you go with the flow and, and it's amazing what shows up in your life. Well, this is, uh, this is also why let's stay a little bit here, uh, for the next couple of minutes, uh, um, growing up in London, um, uh, you you explained to me how you just wanted to travel when you were younger before you left there you wanted to travel and you would come back and you you mentioned that your your grandparents didn't travel more than 35 miles from where they were born and yes you, that's right you, you gave me stories about how your grandmother uh was hanging on to every word of your stories of your travels so when you came back you would tell her about other places in the world which is the f the f the the total flip of what i thought it would hear from you and my own lived experience when I was young. Well, you know, pe people live comfortably within the, you know, the boundaries of their limitations. And, you know, as, as you know, as you can tell, I got a bit of a sense of humor. So, I mean, uh, you know, my, the business is, is bigger limits and some people think that's an oxymoron, but in, in fact, it's an ac accurate, pragmatic description while we're on the planet. We have limits. You know, we live in a 3D world. We're bound by, you know, certain limitations. Um, and, and so I figured if you can push the fences out, then you'll have a much larger and enjoyable life to experience. But, you know, there's still boundaries. Uh, the, some of the boundaries you can cross esoterically, right, through, you know, remote, remote vision or projection or uh, some of the other things, you know, like they uh, studied at Duke. But, um, man, if you've got the choice to do that, what a great life, right? Because you can just be more. You decided uh, to go into IT after university. Yeah. Um, and you, you, you worked in telecommunications and they called you, <laughs> they called you the fixer. Is that yeah, right? I was the fixer. Well, you know, at one point it was called the confidence recovery expert. You know, <laughs> I was a guy that got, got parachuted in to, you know, fix problems when, you know, clients were justifiably upset with something and, you know, th threatening multi-million dollar lawsuits. You know, they found if you chuck Rob in the room with them, all of a sudden people get focused on a solution and stop fighting about each other. Like everybody starts off with, so what's wrong? Well, all that does is, you know, rip the bandaid off and pull the scab with it. And now people are upset and cranky again. I used to show up and say, great, how can we fix this? Well, I was a shock to most people because it never occurred to them it was fixable. All they wanted to do was vent their emotions and their anger and, and it wasn't that they were wrong that they, they had lots of things to be upset about but the upset was just starting point you know the average person and i'm not implying that i'm above average but i'm just saying the average person the way they respond to the word no shuts down most people yeah you know, people yeah. that you'll interview and, and hopefully uh, as people um, uh, grow and, and, and learn, no is the beginning of a negotiation, right? No tells you where the boundaries are, right? 
now that you know, you know, where the guy's fences are or the girl's fences are, now you find a way to either coax them out or you find a way to chuck stuff into the into their enclosed compound that feeds them and helps them get what they want. And, and, and all of a sudden they see who is an, as an as an accomplice rather than an adversary. And if you do that, my God, all of a sudden the doors open and they're willing to talk to you now because who isn't going to trade up to getting what they want? So in most of life, you know, Fulgham wrote a book years ago called Everything I Learned, I Learned in Kindergarten. And it was basically go first, right? Show the other person that you're safe and you're interested in, and you're setting them up to win. And if you do that, you're going to end up with a lot of friends and co-conspirators who will in like contribute back to you but you know most people are expecting the other person to go first right that's that's the you know the the, the trance of fear i have to hold back lest the other person takes advantage of me or yeah. i'll only go first if they go you know well uh, yeah and that's in the world that we learn we grew up in a world where we're taught that it's dog eat dog and i got to fight your way to the top um but i think that's i think that's upside down uh, so I, I'm with you on on the no. Like when I hear no, I get both infuriated and excited uh, yeah. simultaneously because I know now that I'm getting a, a definite answer, and that definite answer I'm always convinced is never definite. <laughs> so there's yeah. always there's always a way to surmount that. But that's also why we have people on the, uh, naturally uh, attracted to have guests uh, to come on that are entrepreneurs, artists, scientists. And folks who believe in um, the 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 power of beyond the five senses, like you, because I think you're all three. I, sorry, maybe I'm paying a compliment here. I'm being too flattered. I think you embody all three. Um, uh, well, some days. On, on some Not days. Not every day, right? But some days. Because uh, you're you're only human when you're awake. <laughs> There's days some people wonder about that too. Yeah. Uh, it, I wanted to add uh, another point to that, and uh, that's it slipped my mind. Um, oh, going first. It's yes, yes, because uh, you know we talked about curiosity, and you said uh, when we were talking about when you were talking about depression, uh, and you suggested that you know you you need to get yourself out of the loop, and sometimes that means go out and act and do something, engage in something, connect with something so that you, you uh, again, these are my words, right? Uh, well, your words are right though. Well, that there's a spark, that there's a spark of something from an external outlet. Um, and it, this brings me to what you told me, the two greatest gifts that we have are, and it, it, this is something now that I've started to tell my kids is curiosity and action. Yeah. And the people who go for, this is another thing that we, uh, sorry, this is my last point. And then you, you, you tell me your thoughts. This is where we fail. I think society fails, especially Western society. It's the, the people that go first. We expect the people that go first to be the winners and they have to win in some sort of materialistic game. But you brought up, uh, Alexander Graham Bell, uh, on a previous conversation. I looked him up, uh, and I'd forgotten a little known fact that's not known by most, but recognized by uh, um, the U.S. government, actually, as of 20 years ago, that the inventor of the telephone was a Florentine scientist who moved to the U.S. and tried to get a patent, but he lacked funds and he lacked, uh, there was a language barrier, he lacked uh, um, uh, the command of English. But he kept extensive notes on his inventions, including the telephone. And as Alexander Graham Bell, who knew this guy, his name is Meucci, who knew him, kept his notes after his death and then filed a patent. So he filed a patent, but he wasn't first to invent. He was first to file a patent. And so all the accolades fall on him. He, the go first was the Meucci guy, but he didn't gain anything. He, he died poor. So society forgets. Alexander Graham Bell is the winner in Western society, in, in the United States, in North America, whatever. Well, he's, he's the winner in that he got there first. But, you know, there are other people that are also uh, en route to the patent office, you know, like Elijah Gray and, and others. The same thing is true for the Wright brothers and, and pretty much every other invention in history. And what that tells me is that uh, I tend to look at it in much the same way that uh, Car Carl Jung looked at things, which is there's a collective unconsciousness, an invisible cloud of, you know, good ideas that are up there. And, so, and some people who are less 
distracted or more focused can stick their, you know, their, their antenna, if you wish, up in, into that cloud and pull down good ideas. And usually the ideas are pulled down by several people at roughly the same time. But it's the guys that act on it that get there and everyone else says, crap, that was my idea. I mean, mm-hmm. when I was at York University in the 70s, I had invented a game, which we played on the computers that we shouldn't have been doing, but you know, I was in the faculty sort of advising department. So invented a game where, you know, you, uh, there was a random maze that got set up and there was uh, treasures that were in the maze. And, uh, you know, there was something that chased you around the maze as you tried to get the treasures. Now, at the time, I thought, oh, kind of fun, whatever. Well, three years later, Terry came out with Pac-Man. Stop went, it. Crap. Right. Stop so again, it. it's 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 not that <laughs> I invented it. I stuck my psychic antenna up and got the idea to same guys as the Terry guys. The only difference is they acted on it. I didn't. And and, you know, as you can probably tell, I like to read a lot and I'm would be put more in the category of um, thinker than um, creative performer. And so one of the one of the things I had to you know learn as, as I grew up was I didn't really value the ideas I had. And the reason I didn't value them wasn't because they weren't valuable. It was because, well, I'm going to have another one and another one and another one. It's like, if you have a million ideas, who cares if you, if you lose one or two? So I, I, later on, I had to learn to put the value on it. And of course, there's some stuff that's coming out next year that where that value is partly gets people off my back because I promised I'd deliver this stuff. But, you know, as I got older, I began to re- recognize, as I hope all people do, in their value. And, and before I get too far afield, I want to say to any of the, any of the listeners who are, have been depressed or know someone who's depressed, that the first thing I would like them to know is depression is perfectly normal. In fact, there are some things you should be depressed about, like, you know, a loved one dies. So uh, depression is normal. What's abnormal is to stay depressed for an extended period of time of, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. That's not normal. And so uh, depression is is something you know or you know someone who's, who's who's struggling with. And I would suggest and just go go be curious. And if you can't do that, then get a plant and grow it. Something you got to take care of. Because every day, every way you'll find that you just get better, which is, you know, the old Kuwait expression. Every day and every way I get better and better. Well, you only get better if you actually do things to get better. Otherwise, you're just a blank slate with no more inputs. And so depression is really just an absence of curiosity. Go find out how happy you can be. Push your limits and begin to doubt your doubts about yourself. So speaking of pushing your limits yeah. um, and self-doubting, uh, so Enrico, let, let's go quickly back to Enrico. Enrico uh, uh, gave a testimonial on a book that became very curious for us. Uh, uh, a, a certain volume, volume three of a book series called Man Being. Mm-hmm. And you and I talked about that uh, extensively too, some of the ideas in that book um, and, the, uh, and the importance of um, being in tune with your creative self and art. Uh, and uh, our connection with uh, our outer self, our esoteric self. Our non-physical self? Yeah, well, yeah, our non-physical self. Yeah, uh, that's the third mind, by the way. Well, so l- let's, uh, let's talk about the curiosity, because uh, you, you, introduced, you introduced that part of the conversation to me through art and how, um, uh, how, you, were, how you were taken by the idea that art flows through you without ego and uh creating creating things uh or the act of creating uh, puts you in touch with something over and beyond should we start there sure so for the audience that hasn't read man being book three uh whose full title is conversations from beyond um it's it's, it's a, a number of different chapters uh, from the point of view of different people. And each one of them adds their own uh, perspective on the man being content, which is uh, something that's been discussed by many authors before, survival after death or survival of personality. I mean, this has been an ongoing 
uh, discussion in, in psychology since what I suppose late 1800s, and um, and the answer is, uh, does it matter if it's true or not? Or to me, the answer is no. It doesn't matter if it's true. Um, what matters is what are the perspectives that are being shared. Are they helpful, and do they help me be a better person? And so, if if it turns out it's true, or partially true, or even more true than than has been recorded in the books, as long as it serves a, a useful and practical value in in my life and others, then it's it's worth reading and, and worth worth considering. And so, um, as it goes back to art, art. As is described in the book, it basically supports my notion that the conscious mind needs to step aside, not disappear, but step aside and be dragged along in flow to the co-creation of what's possible. And, you know, that was one of the biggest challenges um, <clears throat> I had when I was learning hypnosis is technically I'm pretty difficult uh, to get to go into trance. And I realized then the reason it was difficult was <clears throat> My conscious mind was so curious about what happens, it didn't want to miss anything. And so it wouldn't let go. And mm -hmm. so in the beginning, the, the greatest challenge I had was get myself out of the way so that I could experience what was present. And that was a, bit of a bit of a tough challenge. And I think even, even to this day, um, the average person who tends to be more uh, intellectual or thinking, uh, I guess it'd be left brain, um, than the right brain people. I mean, kind of jealous. I mean, the right people, brain people, they just go there, right? They pick up a pen and then they scribble something on paper that, you know, is near photo reproduction. And I look at that and go, wow. And then I try and do the same thing and say, what is that? I say, it's a stick man, right? <laughs> so clearly that, you know, the, the, the differences um, are there. And, and so the creativity, I think, is, is you got to get yourself out of the way and, and be an open vessel to allow the creativity to come through. However, I also think there's a balancing component to it, which often gets lost by people that are mostly, uh, mostly right brain, which is once the content has come through, then, you know, like, like digging up a huge pile of, of, of dirt, you got to sift through it to find what the gold is. And that's where the action piece kicks back in. So, so if a person can, can get to the point where there's more of an integration between the unconscious creation and the conscious mind mining for the gold, then the person is going to benefit on all levels at a far faster rate than they otherwise would if they only used one mind. That's why I also think that the results of the creative process, whatever that creative process is, a scientific one, uh, an entrepreneurial one, uh, or sim uh, I shouldn't say simply, but or an artistic one, um, lacks the language that would otherwise constrict left brain leaning uh, habits. Like it, it, it's non constricting. That's true, but it also all starts from the perspective of you know, what's your starting point? If you're mm. a pessimist, then the stuff you're going to create is going to be relatively unpleasant. <laughs> if you're an optimist, this, this stuff is going to be generally more enjoyable. But whether you're an optimist or a pessimist, you also have to have the belief that you can create it. Because if you don't have the belief you can create, you won't. And why would your unconscious mind constantly disappoint or shock the heck out of your conscious mind by having stuff arrive in your reality that you're unprepared for. Now in science, it's, you know, there's a piece of the brain called the reticular activation system. It's basically at the back of the brain. And it seems to be that the function of that organ is under the control of the unconscious mind. And its purpose is to uh, filter into consciousness whatever the mind is thinking about. In other words, it acts as a, as a great filter to only allow you to see um, that which is consistent with what your belief. So earlier you said that I'd said, you know, I see it because I believe it. Well, I've created the possibility. And so reality then fills the space with what's possible and, and, and perhaps probable. If you don't have that belief, you know, if your belief is I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. Well, you're probably going to see it a lot later 
than someone whose belief is slightly opposite because what it does is it, it shifts it shifts the cause and the effect. So I once worked with you know a client in business who was uh, real estate, and her beliefs was uh, calling clients is basically a waste of my time, and so I'm not going to call clients because I'm not going to get paid. Makes sense because it is it's a numbers game. Mm-hmm. So what I did with her was I, I sh- shifted the belief from I'm not going to call because I'm not going to get paid to I'm not going to get paid because I'm not going to call. And the minute that slight shift in cause and effect was made, right, when she was saying it, it was an effect, the way I gave her back the suggestion was it put her at cause. And all of a sudden, you know, her conscious mind blinked and went, oh, my God, I get it. I got to make these calls if I want to get paid. And of course, the second issue that that she had was she was one of these count up people. So, you know, on average, you got to make 100 calls a day. Mm -hmm. And so she'd get to about call 45, call 50, somewhere in there. And, you know, there there were strikeouts and she'd say, oh, my God, another 50 calls to go. Right. So so I said, fine, then we'll change the belief. You're starting off at 100 and you count down. 99, 98. Oh, I've only got 50 calls to go and then I'm done. Right. (laughs) Fundamentally, it's the same thing. Sure. But it's the starting point, the point of view, and what you're telling your unconscious mind that will generate emotions that will move you forward, or it'll generate emotions that will hold, hold you back. And it's not that it's wrong. It's absolutely correct in what feedback it's giving you, but it's based on your starting point. And since you control your starting point, look at the power people have, but they, they just don't use it because it doesn't occur to them. Well, you also said something that uh, I found uh, fairly wise and to the point, believing in yourself and not believing in yourself, both take up the same kind of energy. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's easy to, it's easy to be blocked to an idea or a belief. If you don't believe in yourself, if you do believe in yourself, then you, you believe that you can, that you can do. Yeah. And, and what, and going back to the hypnosis for a second, you know, hypnosis is nothing but words. I mean, that's it. I mean, you know, you tape a hypnotist mouth shut. I mean, that's it. They got nothing. Right. It's all words. And so in in today's society, people seem to have lost um, the appreciation for just how powerful their words are. And the words are tremendously important because that's what programs your mind. So someone who starts off with, I can't do this because I have no experience and I've never done it before. Well, they're, they're telling themselves the truth. And the answer is, so what? If the same person said, I've never done this before, how can I make this happen? Yeah. Their starting point is the same, but asking the question will unlock capability. Simply making a statement, the, the, the mind shuts down and doesn't do anything. It's like gas pedal, brake pedal. Oh, it's akin to the belief that uh, maybe it is the same thing, that people need an explanation before they take action on it. Well, that's largely to, to answer the question the unconscious mind is is asking on everything that happens, which is, why should I? What's in it for me? Yeah. Now, yeah. you know, a lot of people in, in today would probably say, oh, no, they don't do that. But truth is, everybody's doing it all the time. What are the eight keys? Ah, the eight master keys. Yeah, tell me about them. There's something that I use uh, use in therapy. I mean, they're pretty simple and straightforward. Um, uh, there, there's a there's a self guided course that's uh, coming out later this year, early next year, uh, on a key. <clears throat> they're basically a, a course in mastery. And the difference between commanding and con- controlling. You know, the subtle difference, both people are telling you what you want, what they want you to do, but a commander does it with uh, integrity and respect uh, to the point where you can, people pretty much do anything they're asked to do. Uh, Like a friend, right? You got a real friend, call them at four in the morning when you have a problem, they'll be there. Yeah. Call it, call a pretend friend who says, oh yeah, call me anytime. Call it four in the morning. If they take your call, you're lucky. The first thing they'll ask is, don't you know what time it is? And no, I'm not coming. So a commander is is a person that commands respect and inclusion by others, whereas a controller just barks orders and 
basically uh, manipulates people. And, and, and so there's a, it's the, it's the difference between, that makes the difference. And so what the, what, the, what the eight master keys do is, is they add new perspectives to a person's unconscious mind, which then allows the unconscious mind to act uh, in a more integrative fashion and move forward. Um, I will happily send, send, send the keys to anybody who wants them. Hmm. Um, I'm going to give you the, the website address if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Cool. And we'll put yeah. it in the show notes too, if you want. Yeah. The eight phrases.com. And that's, you know, T H E the number eight and then phrases P H R A S E S.com. And, uh, you know, it'll simply ask for an email address and then it'll mail you the, uh, mail you, uh, what, what the phrases are. And they're non-religious, they're, they're non-spiritual, but uh, they're master keys that unlock uh, integration and enlightenment within an individual um, with consistent use. So, you know, the tagline is enlightenment in one minute a day. I mean, literally in our busy lives, if, if that's all the time you've got is 30 seconds in the morning and 30 seconds in the evening, uh, you say the phrases out loud to yourself and then you watch what happens. Um, other people will look at them as affirmations and they are, but not all affirmations are equal, right? For example, uh, you know, there's a lot of weight loss clients I've worked with who for years had said affirmations like, I love myself just the way I am. And they never lost a pound because the unconscious took it as great. Then if you like yourself the way you are, I'm not changing anything, right? So, <laughs> so all affirmations aren't equal, right? You, you need mm -hmm. affirmations that are generative and in the direction of the change that you want to have. A lot of the stuff, especially some of the stuff on TikTok, you know, it means well, but from a hypnotic language perspective, you need keys that are going to get inside and stick like a burr and unlock the best of you. Can you give us a background on, uh, on the eight keys, why they're called eight keys? Oh, I just called them that. But I mean, the eight phrases, their origin um, <laughs> is, uh, was, uh, I mean, the 1970s, you know, 77, uh, 78 in there, uh, a gentleman who's uh, no longer on the planet, uh, whose name was Michael Blake Reed, uh, who made a pretty good living out of being one of the world's best uh, deep trance psychics, uh, ushered uh, these eight phrases in as the uh, cornerstone of the philosophies for living that the uh, entities that that spoke through Michael uh, based all of their uh, their work upon. Uh, and uh, for those who don't know, a uh, deep trance psychic is someone like Edgar Casey that you may have heard of, or uh, Seth, or uh, Seth was also a '70s personality. Um, who's doing it these days? Uh, well. Uh, the man being books are also being brought into existence this way, as was <clears throat> one of the uh, major books that mm, I would imagine many people have heard of called A Course in Miracles. I mean, that whole book was was channeled um, to a psychologist of all people, someone who knew better and, and knew this was crazy. And, and so she um, she channeled the work and uh, locked it away in, in her uh, desk. And uh, where it sat for, I believe it was uh, 10 years hmm. until one of her colleagues found it. And she reluctantly shared the material with them and, and they published it. Um, oh, I don't know, it was late 70s, I guess it was. And, and realistically, all they did was uh, add some paragraphs and, and periods and titles. Uh, Helen Schumann, I think, was the uh, psychologist that, that wrote the book. Very popular. Um, uh, exquisitely written and um, uh, did it come from her unconscious? Maybe. Did it come through her unconscious? Maybe. That's, you know, that's, that's the version she has. Did it come from uh, some source external of her? Maybe. Uh, I mean, ultimately, again, uh, I don't let those things get in my way if the material is good. I don't really care where it comes from as long as it's helpful. What do you think of death? And where, where do you exist after the death of your body? Um, you mean as in progression of the soul and life after life and or life after death and whatever? And as in your belief? Um, well, uh, personally, I, I believe our consciousness continues on. And whether I believe that because of the 
conservation of mass theory in physics or whether I believe it from, you know, the esoteric stuff, um, you know, where's all this channeled material coming from? Uh, if it's, you know, if, if people, people die and, and, and I suppose from one point of view, um, what's the point of existence if it's not, but to amass, uh, experience, which then helps the soul progress and, and continue on. So, um, you know, I, I just think uh, I'm looking forward to meeting some of the atheist friends I have in this life and see the surprise look on their face. And, and if they're right, then, uh, well, <laughs> I guess that won't be on. But I've had enough experiences to both with, you know, uh, people that are that are channels, good channel, like the, the really good channels, mm -hmm. like the kind the U.S. government consults when they have problems. Um, and and my own personal experiences um you know i did i did research with a professor out of guelph whose name was ian curry who you know did did a fair bit of investigation into past life regression and stuff and uh, you know ian's comment to me after about six of them was wow some people don't learn very quickly and i had a vivid recall of uh, multiple experiences where i wasn't a good guy uh, you know, later on uh, in, I don't know, 90s, I guess I found a book by a professor whose name was Helen Wambach. And she wrote one of the de facto books on the case for past life uh, regression. And, you know, the book is really dry. It's all information and statistics. But but the statistics and the stuff she found, I mean, the, the overwhelming conclusion she came to is, you know, this notion that in our, in our past lives, we were all Cleopatra or we were King Tut or, you know, we were the king of something or other. She, her conclusion was that the majority of lives that, that she documented were all miserable. Short lives, people going through wars, people going through trauma or, or difficulties and what they learned from it. And so... Um, what do I believe? Well, I believe when you die, you, you take the experiences you have with you. I mean, I think those experiences are being fed up into the cloud as Jung called it anyways. We're all contributing to that. You also made light also of other scientists working on technology to help them, uh, help them understand if there's something on the other side. It, Edison was one of those. I had to look that one up because I had no idea, but Edison, uh, tried to invent a necrophone to speak to his deceased wife. Yep, Edison it was inventing the necrophone. A uh, Czech researcher named Rao Dive in, uh, basically ushered in uh, what is now called <clears throat> electronic voice phenomena, which is on certain recordings uh, where static appears, you can hear what appears to be intelligible speech. Now, is that the other side uh, using that medium to communicate with us? Maybe is it is it just a trick of the mind, like uh, the ability to see uh, faces in random shapes? Called I think it's called pareidolia. Uh, the answer is maybe. Um, uh, but the problem with the maybe explanation is when the random voices speak in another language, like Rode, I found that they then got translated that actually contained useful stuff. Um, so, you know, I, I personally prefer to um, believe that it's possible. And, and from that belief, um, you know, I have a far more interesting world to play with than most people that are just, you know, wiping noses, changing diapers and complaining about their, you know, their ex that uh, sits in front of the TV and watches a leaf lose another game. Uh, it, for, again, non-Canadian listeners, the Leafs are the Maple Leafs. Uh, one of the most storied uh, hockey teams on planet Earth who haven't yes, won they, a major trophy in many decades. They haven't won in 40 years. Yes. And, and yet, yeah. yes, and the, and the Tron Torontonians, bless our souls, support them every year we go out and cheer for them. And <laughs> consistently, they have... Uh, yes. Right? So <laughs> anyways, well, you know, good for them. They got a system that works. And, uh, you know, maybe they need some performance hypnosis to get past whatever their limiting thing, thoughts are they don't need to they, they've uh they they got there first uh by being uh, one of the wealthiest teams and not winning major trophies for many decades yeah, so they're I mean, first they invented that process 
Well, yeah, but look at the genius of that. It is brilliant. It's absolutely right? brilliant. In 1950, if you said, hey, let's start a, ho- start a hockey franchise, and our winning model to be the richest team in Canada is we're going to lose for 40 years and everyone will continue to support us. Most people's starting point would have said, no, nah, I can't do that. And yet they did it. They did it. They, they believed. Right? They believed. Absolutely. And not just in Canada, rich, one of the richest in the world, like top three. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so reality can show up very differently than our limited imaginations. <laughs> well, okay. Well, so let's stay on that point too uh, with imagination, uh, and maybe, um, uh, and maybe not imagination. Uh, how, is, how do I ask this question? Um, I believe that most of us have that inner voice. Like there are many people who talk about inner voice. That's something that nobody's embarrassed to talk about. But that inner voice, I'm beginning to believe, is very real. And it's not an inner voice. I think it's us. Um, with some of us, it seems to be that uh, it's more prominent throughout the day, that it's uh, more active and more noisy. And with, uh, with others, like me, I would let myself say, with others, if we just relax and let it be, it comes. Uh, we had, and this was what surprised me, and maybe that's where I'll get the, the I'll, I'll formulate my question for you. We had uh, an MD on the on the podcast. Uh, his name is Jonathan Cardella, and he mentioned uh, to me on the podcast that he um, uh, that he has this voice that speaks to him, and he knows he knows it's not his imagination, that it is a voice that speaks to him, and it's usually when he's relaxing out of the office, you know, he's in the shower, or whatever. But he, he doesn't know what it is, but he wants to pay more attention to it. Um, so maybe this is the question. How do we know that we have an inner voice? And if we do, how can we get more curious about it? Well, <clears throat> first off, while I believe everyone does have an inner voice and inner audio, just as some people prefer to write with their left hand rather than their left, Some people prefer to have uh, images over audio. And uh, as another portion of the population prefers to use their emotions as their primary source of input. So uh, to the inner voice portion, I think we have multiple inner voices. And um, one of them, I believe, is the unconscious, if it talks to you, as in turn left, do this, you know, it's like your GPS. And, and then there's uh, the voice of the conscious mind talking to itself as it's thinking things through. And then there's the, what I would call the esoteric voice, which is, um, I don't know where it comes from, in all honesty. You know, it could be, could be the other side. Uh, it could be telepathy, could be a bunch of things, who knows. Um, but I've learned in my own life, I've learned to recognize um, the qualities of the different inner voices. So when my sub's chatting to me, I know it's my sub. When my conscious mind is busy thinking about, okay, where am I going to go with this? So what's he going to ask next? You know, I, I know it's me. Yeah. <clears throat> the way I recognize the other voice is it has a quality of patience and all knowingness. To it. I mean, like, you know, God, you know, talking to you, but it, it has a quality of patience with it that I don't have in my inner thinking voice. Right? My inner thinking voice is, is pretty quick and abrupt and uh, like a machine gun at times. This other voice, um, it's patient. It has more patience than I have for sure. And I, I guess the other, the other thing is, is it, that voice typically asks me questions, whereas my conscious mind voice is typically focused on analyzing stuff and mm-hmm. making statements. So that's also one of the big quality differences. Um, and at times it'll ask me questions that you know my conscious mind absolutely revolts against. That's not possible, or that's not true, or that can't be, or oh, you're wrong, or whatever. And you know, just this calm little, you'll see. <laughs> and it could drive you crazy at times. Or so I think we all have it. Um, I, I think the way to encourage it, if that's what people want to do, 
is um, uh, first off, create the possibility for it and then trust. And, you know, to our uh, psychological friends in the audience, no, I'm not encouraging uh, schizophrenia or anything else like that. Uh, and would refer you back to a Psychology Today article that uh, 2000 and I don't know, it was four maybe, said um, just because clients have inner voices, it doesn't mean they're crazy. It's just the way some people process. Well, you know, one of the very least read books that was ever published was a two-part volume by a Canadian psychologist named Julian Jaynes. And ground through, breakthrough book, it was uh, uh, The Origin of Consciousness and the Creation of the Bicameral Mind. Well, bicameral for non-Italian folks just means two chambers. And of course, isn't, isn't that what happened, right? The unconscious mind created consciousness. Now, uh, some of the, the rat doctors who like to dissect brains out there probably would disagree with that because they think we're nothing more than a glorified meat computer. But arguably, if we look at what is consciousness, then, you know, I, myself and a lot of your, your fellow um, interviewers, viewees, uh, have, uh, they're asking the same questions. What is consciousness? Um, how big can we get with it? How can we integrate it? And, and what more can we do with it than the traditional get up, go to work, come home, watch TV and go to sleep? And, and so, yeah. Consciousness, exploring the frontiers and then pushing them out so people have bigger limits. And the inner voice helps. And in fact, that name for that for the business came came from that voice. I was I was looking and looking and looking for somebody that would describe, in essence, what clients are going to get if they work with me. And all of a sudden, I said, "Well, they'll get bigger limits." And I went, "Yeah, yeah, whatever." And I went, "Oh, that's sort of cool." Now. When it asked me questions, like one day it asked me, uh, what is the opposite of victim? And of course, I was in the middle of doing something. I was working. And I said, what? What's the opposite of victim? Well, I don't know. It's, uh, I don't know. I couldn't figure it out. I spent 10 days trying to figure out what's the opposite of victim. I even resorted to looking up in Google. Google said the opposite of victim is victimizer. I said, nah, it can't be, because there's got to be something, a third position, maybe even just be an observer, right? You don't have to be the person who's at the end of abuse. And the other option isn't the person who's causing the abuse. Why can't you just be an observer? Or why can't you be somewhere else? So that led to the notion of the opposite of victim is happiness. Well, that, that changes everything. Hmm. So if you're now responsible for, for happiness, then that changes the notion that it's it's like some magic rain cloud that you know rolls through you know your life and if you're in the right place at the right time you get covered in this magic thing called happiness and if you live in the wrong part of town oh well you miss out right this now puts it right back to cause and effect so rather than being at the effect of the happiness cloud what if what if you're the weatherman and you can create the cloud and you can direct it where you want to go well all of a sudden we're right back to be careful what you wish for why? If you can get what you want, then fundamentally what it tells you is you need to make better wishes. And if you have that ability, then by all means, go for it. And, and I, I, you know, so back to what happens after death. Well, I think what's the point of life? <clears throat> right. The point of life is, is, I think, to come here and be told that you can have what you wish for. And so we get, we're in this limited 3D reality uh, as a safety mechanism while we learn to command our thoughts and our wishes kind of kind of nice that you know here you think oh we should do we should blow up this to see what it looks like and you go no no i get that's not a good idea right because if you were god it would just happen instantly so here i think we come here with you know like training wheels on so that we can learn our capabilities and then we we add that to the collective unconsciousness we all grow and <clears throat> in time the you know, hundredth monkey syndrome kicks in and hum humanity gets an upgrade and we all end up functioning better. Maybe, maybe we can just uh, live a life where we don't need to grow anymore once we leave the life. 
Oh, I don't know about that. Hmm. That sounds like perfection. Yeah, maybe it's not perfection. Maybe it's uh, maybe we're maybe we're searching. Maybe we're asking these questions. Maybe we're all having these conversations because we th- th- we're all trying to get at something that we don't know. Not maybe we're all trying to get at something we don't know. And maybe that thing that we don't know is maybe it's one of your eight phrases. But uh, maybe it is uh, a key of sorts. Maybe it is the treasure of sorts that unlocks what the 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 whole idea of our existence is maybe, you know, there are many people who have said this, maybe, maybe we live in a trap. Maybe to use one of your quotes that I wrote down, uh, we were taken out of the environment. Mankind was taken out of the environment and we're disconnected back from that. Maybe our original environment was one. If we're connected to it again, will uh, answer to us why the hell we're even here. And that original environment, I don't know. But maybe that's what it is. Our original environment is what we need to know. Well, that's certainly part of it. And, um, you know, I encourage your listeners to read the man being book, especially book three. Book three is really accessible. You don't even have to read it in order. You can just start off with any chapter that grabs your attention and then work your way through it randomly. And you'll get 90 percent of what the uh, prevailing um, content is. There'll be a few definitions that, you know, you'll have to um, work at understanding. like. Lyra and other things, but for the most part, you'll get you'll get what it, you'll get what's there, and, and it'll resonate with you. So I would encourage people to use that as a, as a test of your unconscious mind's ability to take you where you need to go, hmm. which is a combination of uh, precognition, right? It's precognition, right? It's only in our conscious minds that we believe that we've never seen it before. At an energetic level, what if we've what if we're already tapped into all of it and we just haven't tuned into that channel? Just like there's millions of podcasts yeah. out there or hundreds of television stations, they all exist simultaneously, but you have to make a conscious, willful act to pick one and tune into it. So if your unconscious is beyond those limitations and simply responding to what your conscious mind is asking for or wishing for, then if your conscious mind starts making bigger wishes, why can't you watch two or three channels at the same time? And so let your unconscious mind guide you to the chapter that's going to most have its most profound uh, impact on you and see what happens. But that's that's the difference between the um, what I would say, the real psychic and the hopeful psychic. The hopeful psychic will, will give you will make predictions, but not tell anybody. The real psychic will make their predictions and they'll tell people who will hold you accountable. And then you, you keep track. Um, I got a buddy who, if you just look at his results, you'd think he's he's completely hopeless. And it's with directions. This guy is 100% wrong almost all the time. If you're supposed to go west, he'll say east. If you're supposed to go north, he'll say south. He's 100% backwards. But that's just as psychic and just as reliable as someone who predictably says north is north. You just have to realize that his thing is backwards. Who knows why? You know, when, you know, if the Earth's magnetic field switches positions, as it's expected to do at some point, then north will be south. Well, it doesn't make the compasses broken. They still work. You just have to learn to read them differently. And with that greater awareness, you'll still have all the skills and all the experience and all the know-how. So I would encourage encourage your clients to get to trust their, their unconscious minds. But the way you get trust is you don't write a blank check and hope for the best. You listen to what it tells you, and then you keep track of, is it just an opinion, or is it actually something reliable? And you know what the reliability is, is if you keep track of, how right is it? And even if the how right is it is low in the beginning, as that number moves from 1 out of 10 to 2 out of 10 to 5 out of 10, 9 out of 10, then you know, you've got something really powerful there to work with. And so it's really about learning to trust yourself. Last question, Robert. Last. Last. There's only 300 to go. For now. For now, <laughs> for now only. Yeah. Yeah. What, is, what does greatness mean to you? Really? You didn't expect that. <laughs> Came out of nowhere. <laughs> well, you know, I actually have an answer for it. Greatness is who we are. It is the sum of our many experiences combined, which increases our capabilities. 
a master, as master key number two states, we are more, we are never less. Additionally, greatness is an attitude. It's an awareness and appreciation of our awareness, knowing that you know, and knowing that you know you know. This is a challenge the ancients gave us in the phrase, know thyself. Ultimately, I think greatness is the progression of our soul. And in, in that, we're all becoming greater as we all collectively <laughs> add to the collective unconsciousness. Knowing that we know. Uh, Robert, it's been a pleasure. It has it has been a continuous pleasure, uh, uh, having known you only for four months. It feels like four decades. Well, thanks for bringing the best of us out. <laughs> uh, one thing that you've said that uh, I kind of like um, you said: the unconscious mind gets a vote. Uh, it does. We're 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 going to stick to that. Uh, in our future conversations. I like it very much. Thank you, Robert. You're welcome. Thank you. Let's do it again soon sometime. We will. Hey, it's Enrico Colantoni here, actor, director, and dedicated napper. Like what you heard today, there's more to come. Make sure to subscribe to Behind Greatness and learn about our live events at inspirenorth.com. You'll also find links to our social media right on our website, so be sure to give us a like and follow. Until next time, stay inspired.